I welcome you all to the module two program on basics of um, ophthalmology, small animal ophthalmology. And here, so all of you will agree that before the actual uh, examination procedures, you need to conduct some tests where to basically to assess the intactness of the central nervous system, mainly the nerves. So what happens actually with the eye, we were uh, studying in the last module, uh, we were actually reviewing that point, like uh, the most of the cranial nerves are supplying the eye. In fact, when the, whenever there is a head trauma, that is the first thing the doctors will see, whether they will Ma'am, your mic is on mute. I'm sorry. Yes. OK, thank you. So this um, neuro, in, in this, the neuro ophthalmology is very important and then followed by the sequence of the ophthalmic examination. Under this, actually, we have covered the objectives of uh, the basic objectives like a clinical anatomy reviewed and vision evaluation and ocular examination. So there are different types of evaluation of vision and actually what is new and what is uh, what exactly has to be followed. We will see one by one. And when finally the case has to be referred to a veterinary ophthalmologist. So in this slide, this is again a review of the module one where we have seen the various anatomical points of clinical relevance with regard to the eye pathology. So you have the schematic diagram here and all the structures are also marked. Again, you can see some more slides here added up. So they are the cadaver eyes. OK, so you can you have the cadaver eyes here. So you can start dissecting the cadaver eyes and you can have to look for so instead of looking at the from on the, from the patient side, you can also look for the different presence of the different organs through the cadaver eyes and also I will always say so this slide is actually uh, it's not a it is little decomposed the uh, the cornea looks a little compromised whereas in this you can see the tapetum also this is a freshly um, uh, taken cadaver and to, through this you can also do the dissections either uh, grossly or also through the with the help of a microscope so that will always help you to uh, study the anatomy and also some of the procedures better I stress this point. That is why the slide is here again. We'll go to the next slide. So the supporting structures also we have covered. Under this, the orbit when we were talking about, we were talking about the proptosis of the eyeball and that is why the open orbit, the body orbit is uh, incomplete and in the life it is completed by the orbital ligament. So also the floor, so the orbital floor, there is no osseous or no bony part in the orbital floor. So this will actually render the orbital contents susceptible to trauma from the oral cavity. If there is any penetrating trauma, penetrating uh, some bond piece coming out from the floor of the or roof of the orbit, roof of the oral cavity can enter into the orbit through this because there is no bony orbit in this area. So that also should you should keep in mind when you work on the uh, foreign bodies or some adnexal uh, pathologies in the eye. Now comes the examination chart. So when we are telling you that you should do a very sequential and uh, very um, methodical examination of the eye, you need a, some document. So this document is very important and if you have the document with you, you will be able to enter each and every point very clearly. For example, this is the format which we use here and um, this was designed and approved by our university too. So here, the um, ophthalmic examination chart contains the diagrams. So that is one thing you should, there are various diagrams, uh, examination charts that are available uh, by different universities abroad. But in this chart, actually what we have done is, we have included all the diagrams so that whenever the lesion comes, so you can directly enter in that particular part and say that the lesion is there and the, what is the type of the lesion, all these things you can mark. And um, apart from, so this will also contain the signalment history, the duration of Ill illness, so all those things that you will find in a typical case sheet also will be repeated here. Additional exams that are required also will be there and then followed by a tentative diagnosis. Now here, 
the, comes the diagnostic sequence of the protocol for an eye exam. This is the part one, so which consists of history. The history, of course, you should be knowing about the signalment, primary complaint, concurrent disease, and current treatment. So all these you can look for, look into. And now comes the assessment of the vision and distant examination. So observation of the animal movement in its environment that will be given by the owner or by the client handler, by the uh, pet handler. But in a new environment, in your clinic or in your hospital setup, you have to assess. Then followed immediately after that, you do the STT. Then visual testing, there are series of tests which you have to conduct, then followed by the uh, artaxial structures, then the eyeball and the pupil status. So this is what we are trying to cover in part one. The history is very important and you, can, you have to ask the questions uh, relevant to the condition. For example, the uh, if it is a congenital condition, so this is a congenital condition where you can see some strands inside. These strands are attached to the iris, jumping from one end to the other end. So these strands are pupillary membrane strands. So persistent pupillary membrane supposed to atrophy in an adult eye, but they are still present. So this such type of congenital conditions when you get, you can ask for the occurrence in the siblings. So that is why I said relevant to the condition. Then you use also the visual uh, diagnostics very judiciously. For example, for this, you can use fluorescent, but here you need not use a uh, uh, STT, which is it all, already it looks dry. Okay, so you can use that judiciously. Here you can see a swelling in the near the medial canthus. So you need not ask for whether uh, from when onwards the animal lost its vision. Such things you don't have to ask. And if it is going to, if the animal is blind, for example, this is a corneal opacity where the animal will be blind. And here also, here also you have cataract, the animal will be blind. So when the animal is presented with blindness, address them with a concern. If it's an emergency like this, we have to immediately act. Okay. So first in the history examination, when the patient is definitely have some rapport with the patient. So that is why this part is very important. Usually they stress this point in the uh, human side also. So greet, then report, then you introduce yourself and then ask for the present problem and then smile. Okay, so that you can finish in this part and then you can go for the general examination. So before the initial examination, first, first what you can do, you can actually make the animal to move in the surroundings, in the hospital surroundings and then check for the vision status whether the animal is able to negotiate the object. So this is the first test you have to perform. So this test has to be done before the eye is manipulated. That is very important or any drugs are instilled into the eye. So to measure the tear production, Schirmer tear test paper is inserted into the lower conjunctival cul sac and it is kept there for a period of one minute and the normal is 12 to 15 mm wetting down the strip but if it is less than 10 or 5 you can declare that it is a case of dry eye so that is this is stt1 you have seen where exactly you have to place the stt strip so the stt strip is to be placed like this so if, imagine if this is a lower eyelid and this is a palpebral fissure okay so you are dividing it into three parts. This is the medial part, this is the central part, and this is the lateral part. On the lateral part, on this area, you keep the STT strip. And again, there are two um, research papers are coming up with the readings are different with the closed uh, eyelid and then open eyelid. Okay, with the closed eyelid, you get a little some two to three mm uh, more reading than the open eyelid uh, STT readings. Another important thing which you have to do is whenever you whenever whenever the case is presented, don't try to shine light immediately into the eye, and then that also can cause reflux tear secretion. So before starting any procedure, just ask the history, make the animal to walk on the surrounding on the on the floor, and then make keep the animal on the table, and then you can immediately finish the SCT test. test. Imagine if the case is referred by another vet and they have, they have applied some drops. So in that case also you can ask when they have applied the drops. If it is a, if they would have applied the drops two hours prior to, then these STD readings can be taken. If it is not so, you may have to repeat this. After some time, you have to leave a gap. 
that is regarding the Shermer tear test. Now we will see some neurological ophthal exams. So this is the palpebral reflex. So palpebral reflex is something which you have to definitely do uh, with the this video. So here the sensory nerve is the trigeminal nerve, the that is ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, and the effector is the or the motor is the facial nerve, that is the blink reflex. So you get a blink here, and that means the palpebral reflex is fine. So you have the fifth and the seventh cranial nerves intactness you have certified. Now you come to the uh, da uh, dacile reflex. So in the dacile reflex, though it is actually a subcortical Amazing. reflex, and here actually what happens, here actually what happens is the input or the sensory um, input is taken by the retina, optic nerve, and the optic tract, and then the effector is again a blink or a squint. So when you have to shine bright light into the eye, then only you will be able to um, produce a blink reflex. So you will think sometimes that whenever the cataract is there, how when how the animal is going to blink. But in, even when the cataract is there, you will get a dazzle reflex. In fact, the presence of a dazzle reflex gives you a good clue that the animal might regain vision. It is a subcortical reflex. Now comes the menace test. So menace test is the gesture. The, you are going to a mild gesture. So you can actually, when you do this, you are not supposed to produce any air currents, and you can actually threaten the eye with this, your hand movement. And so during this process, what happens? The sensory is again by the optic nerve, and the facial nerve by the effectors are by the facial nerve and the abducens nerve. So sometimes what happens, there will be a blink. At the same time, there will be aversive movement of the head also to some side and retraction of the globe back and extrusion of the third eye ray. So that means the abducens nerve is intact. So you are able to study the number two nerve, then the seventh and the sixth nerve. So this here you can see, this is a case of uh, opacity in the eye, you can see from here itself. So that is a case of uh, cataract. So you are not, however, you would try to affect a manner's test. There is no blink from the animal. There is no response from the animal. In fact, these tests are, we do prior to cataract surgery and then when we repeat our, in the post-surgical uh, to, to show them that the vision is improved. Okay, so these tests are very important and you have to def definitely review this test prior to, pre prior to the surgery and also after surgery. Then comes the photomotor pupillary light reflex. So here the photomotor pupillary light reflex is shine light into the eye and at the same time take the light away from the animal and then you can see a dilate, dilator of the, you can see the dilatation on the other eye. So that means the consensual reflex also you are studying. So in the PLR you have to study the direct PLR of this side, then the consensual on the other side, then the direct PLR on the other side and then the consensual of the right eye. Then you can also see one more um, dazzle reflex. So this is a case of cataract. You can see opacity is there, but still when you shine light into the eye, the animal try to blink. Then there is also another test to certify the whether the animal is able to see or not. That is a visual placing postural reaction. Visual placing postural reaction wherein 
he will be bringing the animal towards the edge of the table and if the animal sees that there is already there is some obstacle it will try to lift the hand and then keep the hand on the table otherwise they will hit the table first and then only they will realize that okay some obstacle is there then they will raise the leg so that you, that is visual placing postural reaction next comes the pupil exam so the pupil should be examined after this in the neuro ophthal exam itself and declare that whether it is a static pupil or a meiotic pupil or a dynamic pupil etc so static pupil is still pupil so still pupil is something dilated eye normally you get with the help in the glaucoma cases so how to assess this whenever you get a meiotic pupil or whenever anisocoria that is anisocoria is there will be dilatation on one eye and meiosis on the other eye so in the affected eye there will be meiosis at the same time there will be tosis of the uh, upper lid and protraction of the nictitans so all these are characteristics of the horner syndrome so that is actually some lesion you will find in the sympathetic innervation to the eye but you don't have to worry because there won't it will not affect the visual uh, status of the animal so swinging flash light test that is very important so when you shine light into the eye what happens is instead of um, contraction that will dilate when the lesion is there that is why i have written here paradoxical reaction to light and so that is something about meiotic people and significance of meiotic people in the clinical setting there is one more thing that if the animal is presented like this you can see a very highly meiotic people that indicates that some inflammatory reaction is going on or pain is there prostaglandin release is there so that has resulted in the meiosis inside the eye now assessment of the vision with the uh, tracking of light so check whether the animal is able to track the light so you can shine the light from the this is the light from the ophthalmoscope and you can shine it uh, against the uh, against the wall and then examine whether animal is able to follow that so this you can do in the repeat in the ambient as well as in the dim light so the, here i am trying to do that in the dim light also so still he is not interested see and he is comfortably sitting and then trying to sleep and here you can see but if the animal is able to see here the track is able to track the ball very clearly the light ball i used to say light ball so is able to track it very clearly and also they can track the structures on the screen also so you can make the animal to sit in front of the computer screen or also you can have a big screen so that will help them a lot and you can make the some fish or aquarium uh, like thing you can make the fish to move and um, they will check whether they are able to track the fish so these are all some vision assessment you can practice in your clinic then the cotton ball test why the cotton ball test is used because it, it will not make any sound and the cotton ball is used and this is a thermocol ball so can be used to uh, track whether the animal is able to see it okay so that vision is normal then another thing is the obstacle posters so we normally keep some obstacles like this in the path of the the examination room we have a separate examination room for this and we also bring all our uh, ophthalmic patients including a, a kid like this uh, having a problem in the eye so with some visual deficit so any visual deficit animal should walk through this maze test or obstacle course test and you can check whether they are able to negotiate the objects and accordingly enter all these results of this test in the format ophthalmic examination format now the orbit and the globe so after examination of this now you can start your examination in your uh, um, according to your uh, um, procedure like you can keep him on the table and see this is definitely there is a swelling on the eyeball here also you can see some swelling in this cat also so this such kind of swelling you can always say that there is no symmetry at all you don't have to worry much about the symmetry but if the, when the case is presented like this and discharge is there pain is there so then you have to worry about the orbit globe relationship so this is again the orbit globe relationship here the in case of toy bricks you won't be able to see the sclera here the animal is affected as affected the lateral rectus muscle 
so that is why that is moved towards the lateral side and you are able to see the sclera on the medial side and this is again in the center of the eye so you can see the cataractus lens in the center and here the globe has come out so proptosis of the globe these are all happened in the parrot so such a proptosis can also occur subsequent to some lesions in the eye so this is a tumor in the eye so that is why the contents have come out and it is not occupying the orbit this is a very rare case of a, a proptosis of the eye in a goat so you have to directly press uh, apply some pressure on the eyelid margins and check whether the, the whether there is any pain and then if there is discharge like this you can or the cyto tumor like this you can go for a cytology and um, any discharge ocular discharge you have to study the dcr dacryocystorhinography the fluorescent passage time then if the case is presented like this you can look for the presence of luster cluster means the shine on the cornea and you also you can add the sdt readings also you can correlate in these cases now comes the eyelids so eyelids eyelid margins eyelashes punctum upper and lower and the lacrimal apparatus and tear secretion so all these things will contribute to the normal ocular surface so that is osd ocular surface disorders are separately studied now you need definitely a magnification to identify this and palpebral fissure also sometimes on the eyelids we used to measure and so this is something normal in one eye so it is you can use a digital caliper like this and then measure the palpebral fissure length sometimes the eye lesions in the eyelids are will be very obvious so you don't you don't have to really use any additional equipment to view this so here you can see the palpable fissure is not uh, not a oval it, it is it is uh, irregularly shaped and we call it as sometimes a diamond shaped uh, thing and here also you can see the eyelid which is not formed properly and this is a normally formed eyelid but there is a protracted nictitans so you have to look into that and here also you can see some mild swelling here on the near the medial canthus now this is a picture to slide to show you the tumor is there so you are doing the stt at one cor corner okay not at this here also you can do an stt some stt strips will be colored like this so that the wetting down can be ready easily and this is a uh, actually a bird which was brought to our unit with a closed eyelid so eyelid will be closed that is called ankyloblepharon ankyloblepharon is the addition between the upper and the lower eyelid and you have a physiological ankyloblepharon and a acquired ankyloblepharon the physiological ankyloblepharon is something you see in puppies where the eyelids will be closed immediately after birth and it will be open only in 10 to 12 days period acquired ankyloblepharon can happen due to some additions in the or infections in the eye then the nasolacrimal duct system that also can be assessed with the help of a fluorescent dye test and fluorescent can be instilled and whether if the, if the patency is there the appearance of the dye in the nasal ostium will be immediate if it is not immediate if it is come comes out with less than 5 minutes then you can say there is a partial block so you can also if there is a partial block under sedation you can cannulate the upper punctum and also you can do the probing of the nasolacrimal duct and try to flush the nasolacrimal duct also and remove the obstruction in the nasolacrimal duct so, so upper punctum is not having much uh, if there is a block in the upper punctum the if and the tear can get drained through the lower punctum so the more thrust is for the lower punctum if the lower punctum block is there then you will find epiphora as a common clinical finding so in this you can see the fluorescent dye is and you can make a, actually a drop of the fluorescent dye so this is the uh, you can take a, a syringe like this and then you can make a solution of it and then put one drop into each eye so this is one method if you are if you can you can also practice the strip directly onto the eye so wherein you have to keep the strip on the uh, bulbar side of the conjunctiva so this is the classical sign of epiphora you used to get in the in your clinical settings and when you get this 
immediately you have to go for a STT. STT will be more than 25 because there is a PFORA. And then the next test you will be carrying out is fluorescent dye test. So you can change the, we were talking in the module one about the filters that are available in the ophthalmoscopes. So the cobalt blue light of the filter can be used and then check for the fluorescent effect of the uh, stain. So in doing so, uh, this is uh, negative, but here you can see some uh, fluorescent on the nasal area. So some animals, what they, what they will do is they will try to sneeze. So from that, you can make out that, okay, that eye is going to come out, okay? So that is one thing. But in a bulldog, in a brachycephalic bulldog, what happens is this nasolacrimal duct will be very tortuous. So the absence of the dye in the nasal ostium does not indicate that the duct is blocked. Okay, so always because of its tortuous nature, sometimes you won't get here. So that you have to necessarily open the mouth and check for the presence in the oropharynx. So if it has come in the oropharynx, then you can say that there is no block. So this is the tear well. Normally tear well you may not be able to appreciate, but here uh, once because you have in, put the drop fluorescent drop into the eye, you are able to see the tear well completely. And first you can check the eye and then you can come to the nasal, nasal side and also check. So here also there is a block here it has come in one eye. So yes, no, 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 this is the other eye. So the other eye also you can examine and check for the patency in that particular in duct. So both the ducts you should examine uh, separately and then arrive at the conclusion. So in this video, you can see I am trying to examine the palpebral rim, that is the orbital rim. So we are just slowly reflecting the palpebral eyelids up and down, and then I am trying to affect some pressure on the medial canthus. So when you do this, the nictitans will prolapse more over to the cornea. So in this way, you can examine the periorbital rim, the eyelids, and also you can examine the nictitans and the lower eyelid, presence of any cilia, additional cilia like ectopic cilia or dystachia. So all this you can observe with the help of a additional magnifications like this. So this is a simple procedure. You just used your indirect ophthalmoscope to view all these structures. So it is not that you have to use ophthalmoscopes only for the fundus study. You can start from the eyelid down. So with this, we have covered up to the nasolacrimal apparatus, the orbit globe, abnormal structures, nasolacrimal apparatus. Now we will see the conjunctiva, the nictitating membrane, the position of the nictitating membrane that is very important. And which is, which is, you may not be, normally you will not be able to diagnose initially. Okay, so you have to definitely spend some time and you can, you have to look for the pathology, whether it is present or not, then you will find. Then in the cornea, transparency, shine, surface, etc. Then the anterior chamber, iridocorneal ankle, the gonioscopy and all is a specialized procedure. We will try to cover that also.
so the conjunctiva you, we have studied about the three divisions of the conjunctiva how to diagnose how to examine this conjunctiva so under local anesthesia that is under propracaine anesthesia or you can put some local anesthetics in the eye and try to distort the eye with the help of an instrument and if the vessels are also moving along with the conjunctiva that means a it is an inflammation on the conjunctiva. If the vessels are not moving, it is down means it is on the sclera. So in STT, cytology and culture. So all these diagnostic tests are important in the conjunctiva. Then the culture study. So culture is very something very common in case of equines. So that is why you have a picture of horse here. So topical anesthetics should be avoided. So whenever you do an ABST test or any fungal test, you are not supposed to put any topical eye drops, thinking that the animal will cooperate more, then I can take a swab, so nothing like that, you will not get a good result. So you have definitely this presence of the topical anesthetics will prevent the growth of the organisms in the uh, dish and then you will not be able to get a good, re good result. So a cotton swab moistened with a sterile saline or broth is actually rubbed over the corneal surface and or the conjunctival fornix and that is how you are supposed to take a for um, swab and then you can also use a spatula under topical anesthesia. So in the diagnostic procedures, so we were talking about the conjunctiva, so you can use indirect ophthalmoscope. There is another good instrument, this is the Phenof Trans Illuminator. So this Trans Illuminator, the advantage is there is a narrow handle here, so through the uh, this part, the steel part, the actually the light will emit out and the advantage is you will be able to shine light only in the required area not the whole eye will be under illumination so you will get a good cooperation from the patient this is some instrument which i like very uh, very much when you use a uh, on the eye you will think that you have a pen torch what is the need for this but it is not so so you will not find any reflection from the surrounding tissues that is the name is phenof trans illuminator so the nictitans membrane, the membrane has got the palpebral as well as the bulbar, the inside part. So you have to search for the foreign bodies. That is one important thing if there is a recurrence of infection. So this is the nictitans. This is the normal position and little protracted area, not very normal because maybe because the animal is frightened because it is trying to retract the eyeball little back and then you would have taken a picture here. You can retract the so after putting some local anesthetic with the uh, bud, cotton bud or whatever uh, you use, and then try to reflect the third eyelid and look for the presence of any foreign bodies. Here also, the presence of the nictitans is pushed towards one side because of the protracted of the, it is displaced rather because of the presence of a nictitans gland prolapse, third eyelid gland prolapse, cherry eye, very commonly called. Here, the nictitans instead of it is see the free margin of the nictitans that is very important look for the free margin if it is like this it is you can put a tick mark here it is wrong see it is actually the it got averted so the this aversion or there is one more uh, pathology you will get in nictitans that is the scrolling of the third eyelid the instead of aversion the third eyelid margin will get scrolled inwards these are all due to defects in the t cartilage of the third eyelid then the granular, you will find sometimes granular deposit, um, uh, projections like this. So this is follicular conjunctivitis. Very, um, also, you will find more in the third eyelid. And here also you can see a mild, the free margin is not correct. It is There is a projection you can see. So this patient was brought to us with some mild bleeding. It's the same patient only here. So you can see the, um, you can see the, so the, here that is how you here you can see the nictitans the free margin of the nictitans is not uh, smooth okay so you use some magnification and then see so here i am using a phenof trans illuminator to examine this patient is not a very quiet patient okay though we try to cajole him we were not getting good co cooperation from this patient so in such cases also this phenof trans illuminator is of a very good help to you. You can examine from a distance and a focused light can be directed towards the lesion. So the diagnostic kit, so we were talking about jumping from the STT, then you have to be with, you have to 
where the is abc abc swab should be there so all these things we were talking so these are the things you should have definitely on a uh, in the diagnostic kit in a tray so the fluorescent strips the tear strips then the abst swabs then you should have a number 11 bp blade so you can take some scrapings also with the uh, blunt end of the blade then need some slides and here also you can see the cotton uh, balls cotton balls can be cut in the uh, as a ready thing for uh, examination of the uh, vision and you also have some ibo um, antibiotic uh, this is the proper again and these are all antibiotics and this is a dilator and uh, the blue thing is actually not an ant uh, yes it is an antibiotic so actually i do not know whether you know that the cap actually indicates what type of medicine it is okay so we will come to that in ortho uh, therapeutics so then you have the strips and you have some earbuds this is a cautery so this is a uh, cautery which is a handheld cautery so i used to keep that also in handy along with all this so that if there is a mild uh, tumor or anything mild small projections on the eyelid margin under local anesthesia you can remove that also so this is the diagnostic kit that should be readily available to examine the eyelid and the surface uh, of the cornea and conjunctiva now on the cornea surface means we talk about only the precorneal surface okay now actual cornea starts with the anterior epithelium that we have seen in the module one you have to look for the luster transparency so when the transparency will be affected whenever there is a cloudiness in the cornea that is when the stromal layer of the cornea is affected the, you will find cloudiness then vascularization indicates little inf uh, inflammation so inflammation of the cornea you will find vascularization happening in two ways that is vascularization can happen from the sides of the lymphal vessels or it can also have if it is a superficial infection in case of uveitis it arises from the ciliary vessels then edema so if the transparency is lost and it has gone to the next stage we call it as edema then another the next stage is the opacity so that is why this opacity will be graded in the cornea as zero as transparency then plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 and plus 4 so during this process what happens the thickness of the cornea also will be more and the sensitivity also will be affected so such a cornea you are going to examine with the help of a different um, equipments style ophthalmic instruments starting from the ophthalmoscope so before that focal illumination will help in a dark room so you have to necessarily make the room darker or dim the uh, light in the examination room and then do the exa uh, examination on the cornea cytology scraping culture fluorescent test and std all this helps to assess any pathology on the cornea so the fluorescent dye test which we have already seen i am going to stress here one point like this is not a positive test because this uptake of the fluorescent is taken by the uh, deposits that is the discharge that is present on the eye so what do you have to do every time close the eyelid and then open again and then see whether the such lesions are moving or you can also re examine the patient after washing the eye with the distilled water and then again examine the patient then you will find the smooth cornea so this is a cornea where the uptake of the fluorescence is there in the center of the cornea so this is an axial ulcer axial in the center of the cornea this is the peripheral cornea and this is the central cornea so there is an ulcer active ulcer in the center cornea so we were talking about vascularization there is one more point vascularization of the cornea is called pannus cornea is transparent because there is no vascularization cornea is transparent because there is an orderly arrangement of the collagen fibers cornea is transparent because there is no pigmentation okay but when the pigmentation and vascularization happens when when there is chronicity of the case when the condition is chronic you will find vascularization and pigmentation on the cornea you will also find vascularization on the cornea when the ulcer heals okay so that is the area when you will try to decide whether you can change the drug from plain antibiotic with antibiotic with the corticosteroids so that that is i will come to that when we deal with the corneal ulcers so vascularization 
is a very important part in your corneal assessment, especially in the corneal ulcer healing. So different pathologies occur on the cornea. That is, you can see a dermoid here. So this dermoid is cyst of the eye. This is the excision after the uh, dermoid excision. You can see the transparency of the uh, iris behind the uh, dermoid. Okay, this is the dermoid area and you can see that this was an interstitial ulcer. So we grade the ulcers as grade 1, grade 2, grade 3. So this is a grade 3 to 4, I will say. You can also see the desmets and uh, underneath the desmets you can also see the black tissue that is the prolapsed iris. Okay, the iris is occupying almost the people. And so um, this is because of the escape of the some fluid from the eye. And this is the picture after healing. Okay, so you can heal the wound. And such a healing, if the surface area is more for the corneal ulcer, and it all depends, like if the patient is not going to cooperate, you have to think about the tarsography or a third eyelid flap or a conjunctival flap or amniotic membrane flap. So all these, or a contact lens, bandage contact lens. So all these you can think of for the treatment. But what, actually what happens from my experience is corneal ulcers when you treat, you can always wait for the cooperation from the patient. You can also judge how good your uh, uh, pet parent is in administering medicines. And are they actually devoting their good time for the actual taking care of the patient? So in doing so, when you go for a medical therapy, the transparency of the tissue can be maintained well. But if you have gone for a surgery, what happens? You will find a scar in the center. Okay, especially when there is an ulcer in the axial cornea, subsequent to the healing, if there is a scar in the center, that will definitely affect the vision of the animal. So this is a um, test. This is a thing which I have uh, seen in the Corrett School of Veterinary Medicine in Israel. So uh, Professor Ron Offrey is there. He is trying to examine the sensitivity. So they normally do this sensitivity test with the help of a small thread bandage roll you can take and then just touch the cornea. So here we are with the help of a cotton bud. So we try to touch the cotton bud and then for the uh, blink ribs. So corneal sensitivity is very important because cornea is the most sensitive part of the body and of the, uh, the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve supplies. We are trying. We are trying to use the Dr. Narendra is using the the bud to touch the cornea and checking for the reflex reflex of the for a blink reflex. So corneal cytology. So corneal cytology is also another one of our PG student is taking a cytology from the cornea that is with the help of a spatula like this. So, so that is also uh, possible when you do such kind of cytology. Normally, I don't do cytology much unless and until you get non-inflammatory keratopathies. So non-inflammatory keratopathies due to you, know, you these conditions are more common in adult breed of dogs, large size breed, breed of dogs, where um, you get a corneal deposits of calcium, cholesterol, that is called lipid keratopathy.